Well, I'm very glad to be here to talk about talk about planetary health, a very important term uh, of like an emergent science that is really important for the sustainability of this planet. So today is a really, really important event where we are celebrating the accomplishments, the potentials, and the promises of science and technology, which are definitely very, very well worth uh, celebrating because because of science and technology, particularly in biomedical, uh, chemical, and health science field our life expectancy have been really dramatically uh, increasing over the past uh, 50 years or so. Uh, child mortality has been decreasing thanks to the really a lot of the health science research that have been done and practiced in the field. And poverty rate has also been decreasing over time. But the picture is not all rosy. All right, because like coming along with the big science and technology progress that we have and improvement in uh, livelihood and living standard actually come at a cost. And the cost is first and foremost on our planet. We are really putting in order to you know, make all of these accomplishments, we have really exploited the planet at a really unprecedented rate. For instance, we're putting so much CO2 in the atmosphere right now. Okay, so right now we are at a level that is like the highest uh, for the past a few hundred thousand years. We are really at a quite a warm planet right now. And we have been acidifying the ocean and uh, major marine ecosystems are actually collapsing all over the world right now. We are increasing energy use, we are destroying tropical forests, okay? And uh, in really using a lot of water, putting a lot of fertilizer and nitrogen into the environment. A topic that I'm going to come back to uh, very soon. So we are changing the environment so much that we are even modifying the geological records, okay? So if an alien come to Earth, maybe, uh, you know, like a few, uh, a hundred, like right now, and they look at the long historical records of the geology, okay, they would see that we are dramatically changing uh, the geological records for the past 150 years. We even call ourselves, uh, or we define a new geological era called the Anthropocene now. Right, as distinct from the Holocene that you may have learned from your geography lesson. And into the future, we are definitely not getting better, right? And uh, we will even have put more you know, people into the world, uh, needing much, much more food, okay? And uh, we, need a l we even need to double our food production in order to provide uh, for the increasing populations and uh, really having a lot of driving uh, uh, water demand as well. So now the situation is kind of like, okay, we're in like a relatively well-off society where we are benefiting from a lot of the science and technology, but at the same time, a lot, other, a lot of other people in relatively poor world, they're actually suffering more and more from uh, such kind of environmental disasters. And the concept of planetary health is really about how we, when we damage the planet, ultimately, we are actually damaging our health. Okay, it's kind of compromising or, or kind of like uh, compensating for the uh, advancement in biomedical science that we have had. Okay, because on the one hand, we are improving health, and on the other hand, we are damaging people's health as well by polluting the environment. So climate change is predicted to actually cause a lot more uh, death in the future. We are causing a great loss of biodiversity, basically depleting the, uh, for instance, the medical resources that can, we can actually extract from uh, the biosphere. And uh, a lot more people are going to be under uh, undernutrition in the future because of we cannot really keep up the pace to grow our food. And uh, water use, soil degradation are all causing a lot of significant damage to people's health as well. So I guess my idea here, or many people's new idea, emerging idea is that to safeguard human health, actually, we need to maintain the health of the planet in which we uh, depend on. So of course, uh, there are a lot of solutions and a lot of these kind of solutions I'm not even going to talk about. They're all about, many of them are about uh, policy making, better governance and uh, pro perhaps like community work and so on and so forth. But here I would like to emphasize science and technology on the one hand may be what's driving the environmental you know, uh, uh, depredation, but on the other hand, they have high potential to actually, so to speak, save the world as well, as long as the sustainability thinking is in the core of scientific innovation. And here I'm going to sort of like suggest how in the remaining maybe five minutes or so, suggest how scientists and engineers may help to uh, save our planet. So on the one hand, definitely we need to figure out what is really going on in a very complex earth system. A lot of the environmental problems are really a cascade of issues that are not isolated from each other. 
And thus, we need to really understand you know, the chemistry, the physics, and the biology of all of these systems in the Earth. And at the same time, working together with engineers to really come up with solutions uh, to solve our food, water, energy, and human health crisis that are coming in our age. So in the remaining time, I'd just like to highlight some research that are done locally here by my colleague and I uh, together. So this is a framework that I'm going to use to uh, sort of maybe due to the time limit, I will come back to this. I'll first give an example, um, example of what local researchers have done. So this is my colleague, uh, Hon Ming, Lam Hon Ming, okay? Uh, Hon Ming Lam, uh, who is actually one of the most famous scientists in Hong Kong. He's even featured in one of our uh, sort of like a, a TV, uh, sort of TV series of uh, our scientists. So what, he, what has he done? He has, his team has been painstakingly looking at the genomes of soybean, all right? Soybean turns out to be one of the crops that may hold the potential of solving a lot of environmental issues, it turns out. And uh, he looks into the genomes of soybean and uh, really try to figure out what kind of to drought tolerant or stress tolerant genes there may be in soybeans and try to isolate them, breed them in a natural way, all right? And, uh, and also to practic uh, practice uh, growing them in the field as well. So through a lot of painstaking work, actually right now he has uh, bred a lot of um, uh, drought tolerance, salt tolerance, and heat tolerance uh, soybeans that can actually be grown in very dry places that are prone to climate change. So these kind of technology can really be used to help solve the food security crisis because uh, if our world is getting warmer and some places are getting drier, such kind of crops can actually hold the potential of still supplying our food. But, and there are also other aspects of soybean that are good, okay? Soybean is a nitrogen fixer, which means that it can absorb or create its own nitrogen and provide that nitrogen for uh, other crops as well. So one of the questions that uh, Hon Ming has asked is, okay, if we want to grow soybean, okay, on a larger scale, what are exactly the larger benefits or environmental benefits that can be done? Because, you know, being an experimental scientist, they, they, they grow the beans and then they claim that this is good for the environment, but we don't really know unless we can have some form to uh, have an experiment on the environment. But of course, we do not do experiments on the environment because there's no control setup that where we can compare, you know, the experimental setup to. So we talk together, we, uh, I'm a, a computational scientist, so I'm exactly the kind of person who can ask questions like, if we grow soybean in a larger area, okay, in, in, or replacing or using intercropping in order to uh, maybe grow soybean alongside other crops in order to uh, reduce fertilizer use, uh, to rip the benefit of nitrogen provided by soybean, for instance, what are exactly the environmental benefits, okay? So we do this computational study uh, from really, which is a social case for how we can scale up small scale studies to large scale impacts. And this is what we found. It turns out that, you know, using our, the best knowledge that we have and all the computer modeling tools that we have, we can really see that uh, if we try to grow soybean, okay, alongside other crops, in the whole of China, right, which are dominated by monoculture right now, right, which is very bad for the environment, we can greatly reduce the amount of fertilizer that we use, okay? Fertilizer is hugely overly used in China right now, causing so much environmental problems. But if we, you know, kind of uh, rely on soybean uh, and, and reducing ammonia emission, there can actually be a benefit for the environment, not only because it reduces greenhouse gas emission, but also, you know, the PM 2.5 problem that has been afflicting China can also be partly uh, sort of alleviated, okay, through our comp computer modeling network. We continue to do, you know, cost and benefit analysis together with social scientists. Uh, we can really see that the yield benefit, the saved fertilizer, the saved health cost because we reduce air pollution can all can all sort of like overwhelm the increased cost of uh, doing intercropping. All right, so this is kind of like a showcase research saying th th these pieces of information are actually really important because 
the, such kind of large scale analysis are needed for the policy makers to really value what this such kind of technology can do, what benefits it can bring on a larger scale. Because a lot of scientists can be, you know, oh, okay, we are inventing this and that and with a lot of potential, but uh, they also need like more evidence showing, okay, so what can such kind of technology do uh, on a larger scale in order to convince policymakers to perhaps embark on more uh, sort of implementation of such kind of technology. So I'm going to skip all of these. Uh, this, I'm sorry about that, but Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, so here I, uh, to conclude, I would like to invite maybe a lot of uh, scientists here to think about how we can work together to perhaps address some of the most important environmental issues like pollution, climate change, uh, soil degradation that we are facing. Indeed, all of you can play a part. The experimental scientists, the field, uh, the field scientists, and the engineers can all come up with, you know, the physics, chemistry, and biology, and also the technology, or uh, the, the technology that we that can potentially be used to perhaps address environmental issues. And at the same time, to really look into the mechanisms, the mechanisms that are driving or that are controlling environmental processes. And we, as a computational scientists, we really require your data and inputs and your scientific understanding in order to do our uh, sort of a computer simulation. So we computational scientists usually uh, use big, you know, a uh, 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 high performance, you know, supercomputers, so to speak, okay? Supercomputers incorporating everything that you guys tell us, okay, into our model, trying to run it and produce simulated outputs and also projections for the future, which are really needed for policy making. For instance, uh, the seasonal forecast of next year's crop yield, rainfall, are very important for farmers to plan when and how and what kind of strains of crops they need to grow in order to sustain their livelihood and also the yield next year. At the same time, we also need the climate scientists to tell us how much you know, uh, sea, sea level rise. Uh, there, there will be in a certain city like Hong Kong uh, that civil engineers actually have to take into account when they build their uh, sewage system, so on and so forth. So such kind of projections are extremely important, but all of them would not be possible without the experimental and field scientists that rely heavily on. And one last point though, in, with the increasing amount of you know, data that are available out there because of satellite and um, other, other sources, there are a lot of data to really explore. Machine learning and statistical methods and machine learning and artificial intelligence can really help us incorporate the amount of data that we have to really improve the scientific understanding, improve our numerical models such that we can make projections that are more reliable, uh, that policymakers and social work, uh, uh, people who work on econ economy uh, and policy can really use to make better policy for the future. So I would just like to end by inviting all of you to maybe think about how you can also take a part in uh, ensuring a sustainable planet. Thank you very much.